really looking forward to this. It's uh, it's something that I am very passionate about. It's something that um, I love talking about, and it's something I love sharing. Um, it's also something I've seen work really, really well. Uh, a few companies, and in particular at Despoilink, which uh, Simon mentioned at the start. So while it may not be appropriate for you or work in all places, I've seen it work really well. Um, and I will continue to, to talk about it as much as I can. Whoops. Oh my word, that's what happens when you push buttons too quick. Okay, so we're talking about risk storming, a, a little sneak peek in the top right-hand corner. Uh, a risk storming is really, it's a, it's a collaborative exercise. It's one that's best done with people, which is likely why I just love it so much. You can do it by yourself, of course, but with most of these methods, most of the ways of working is really to get people to talk to people. And that's where the magic happens. And so it really is around how can we, how can we really focus on what matters to us and our product? Um, how can we think about the risks that might endanger those aspects of what really matters? And how can we try and mitigate those risks from happening? So it, and it works all around the board um, and is enabled by a pack of cards. Now, the process I'll be talking about here is very... I'll be describing a very physical approach. It works great in a room, but you can run this remotely. Okay, so if you've uh, got excited with this talk and went off to your favorite search engine and typed in risk storming, you may have come up with this. So if there's one thing you remember from this talk, it's not this. So if this looks familiar to you, uh, this is not it. It's another approach to identify risk, but at a much deeper code architectural level. You want something that looks like this in the top left-hand corner. Now, feel free to take screenshots of this if you like, but I'll be making all the slides and all the details where you can get everything, including the materials to run the workshops and the guides themselves available in our, our Slack channel afterwards. So don't worry about that. Okay, so risk storming itself is enabled by uh, a pack of cards and that cards deck is called Test Sphere. Um, as an Agile coach, if you like your card deck, then you can add this to the list. Now, there are many things you can do with a test sphere deck of cards, and risk storming is just one of them. So, uh, and it focuses largely around a product and the elements of a product. And in particular, uh, you'll notice a lot of sort of patterns and sort of testing, uh, testing sort of mnemonics that sort of come up. Um, they're broken down into uh, a number of different things. So it describes a concept. So this might be a pattern. It describes, it has a slogan to help you remember what that is. And then some examples of what you can do. Um, there is a, excuse me, just, okay. There is a additional packs that you can add on that, that cover uh, a number of different attributes, in particular, if you're in a CDCI pipeline, um, and also covers the sort of observability and monitoring, which is certainly much more popular these days. Okay, so every good board game starts with a board. Uh, very briefly, you'll notice that what we have in the middle is something we want to talk about and discuss, in this case, the system under test. We'll have our attributes around the side in terms of things that matter to us that we'll describe as a team. And we build out layers as we go out of that sort of onion, uh, trying to mitigate those. So we start with what matters. So we discuss as a team and we try and discover to us six most important quality aspects from the card deck of, I think, over 20. In practice, there's probably over 100 when you combine them together. So you really have to, uh, a bit of forward planning can sometimes help. So we may say in this case, we think structure is the most important thing for our product, the way that it is built. I'll highlight that uh, a prior knowledge of the card deck can be super helpful. Starting with a new team, uh, we've certainly uh, seen in display, I'm gonna uh, thank Tony for this, um, where she put together sort of groups the cards in particular orders. Um, so we had like efficiency, functionality, maintainability, and then we would pick from that card deck and then go dive a little deeper. And this allowed us to filter out the cards really quickly. So once we've decided on our six, and this usually can take up to 25 minutes, half an hour, um, we'll start 
brainstorming risks. Um, and we'll put them around the board. And what we might do is actually call out these risks as we go. As uh, the important thing is to understand what that risk is uh, and to acknowledge it within the team. And this is a risk that is identified to threaten the quality attribute that we first identified. So in this particular case, we've identified a risk that might impact the structure of the thing that we're building. The next thing is to, is to use the test fit cards to actually use them as a mitigating strategy and how we might be able to mitigate those risks related to the thing that we care about. So we might decide to pick a particular uh, heuristic. This is an example of it in practice with actually a displaying product. You can see here we had six um, quality attributes. We'd build out some risks and then we started working through the deck to see how we could mitigate these going forward. Would we mitigate them all? Probably not, there's a lot there, um, but it certainly allows us to sort of pick up themes, right? There's more in one area than another. Maybe that's an area that we particularly want to focus on. Sometimes teams felt that they had enough knowledge without the sort of benefit of flicking through all the cards, but what they really wanted to use is use the framework, still focus on things that matter, but actually mitigate, identify risks, but mitigate them with known uh, practices uh, and known approaches that are already familiar to them. So they weren't having to learn something new. Both of these practices, both of these approaches work super well. So at this point, we've just talked, like it's, it's great, right? We have a team together. We've found out what matters to us. We have gone around a board. We've identified risks that are associated with things that matter and how they may impact the value of the product. Um, and then we've decided how to mitigate them. And that's great, but it doesn't actually solve anything. It, it highlights information, but we don't get any further. So the other, the important thing to do after this is actually decide what to do next. So we might put up a, probability impact model and we'll actually start mapping those out. Maybe we've only identified a couple of key areas of risk that are related to the work we're doing and we're going to build them into our sprints and iterations. Maybe some of the risks are beyond our control and we need to surface these to other teams or other areas of the business. So I think the important thing with any of these frameworks is they're a great part, a great start for conversation, but it's really what you do next is the, is the really important part. So as I've been talking for about seven minutes um, and I wanted to make sure that I had enough time, I wanted to go through some of my sort of my sort of thoughts and observations on this and just while we have a minute. Um, and that is largely I've, I've seen this work very well um, with teams that are very new um, and very new to a sort of working together. It provides a nice, easy tactile framework uh, to start thinking about risk. I have risk isn't something that we always uh, focus on when sort of delivering value, right? It's always about how can we build incremental versions of the product and thinking about risk in this way allows it in build it into our, into our flow of work. Um, using the test sphere cards, we actually, we have a knowledge sort of a built up knowledge at our fingertips where we actually can flick through and actually decide how we might be able to uh, mitigate these as we go. I've seen this work really well with um, offshore teams. I've seen it work really well remotely. I've seen it work really well with software as a service products, which I'm at, at the moment, but also hardware based products. Um, it really is just around that sort of facilitation of communication, which ultimately is the most important thing. I'll stop there and just say thank you for your time. Um, hopefully I didn't speak too quickly. And um, yeah, we'll look forward to the questions at the end. Okay, uh, thank you very much for being such a great audience. And I'm delighted to talk to you today how to make your social media more inclusive. And just a very quick background, I'm a head of uh, digital scientific services for an engineering and software company. And my background is computational chemistry. I did quite a lot of coding during my PhD and postdoc, but now I'm more centered around customer service uh, worldwide. That is one hat. And I have another hat as an inclusion strategist where I advise organizations about how to reach to untap market 
markets, uh, boost uh, innovation, and also retain talent by leveraging diversity and inclusion. So as you can imagine, with those two hats, a huge milestone for me was when I, I launched my own website about diversity and inclusion in tech. That unfortunately didn't last long because very soon I realized that my website was inaccessible. That means that people using screen readers could not make good use of my website. A screen reader is a technology that helps uh, people uh, that has visual impairments, disab um, cognitive di uh, disabilities are elderly or they are um, learning another language uh, to interact uh, with digital devices. So you can imagine that that made me realize the gap between my intent and my impact. And what I realized is actually, I got that wrong uh, regarding uh, the focus of inclusion. I was focusing on uh, being inclusive like that was a chromosome, rather than embrace it as a practice, as something I can learn and improve. So today, I'm actually uh, going to share with you five tips and to make them easier to remember, I've, uh, 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 I've created a formula in honor to our host with three C's, an A and an E, okay? Uh, so hopefully you will be able to remember it. So the first C goes for color contrast. And as you can see here, it's quite difficult to read uh, as we age, uh, our uh, color contrast uh, capabilities decrease after 40, 40 years. So, and if you are old, so old enough to reach eight, uh, 80 years old, you may have lost up to 85%, okay? So if you want to keep people engaged on your social media, ensure that the contrast between your let your text and your background is a, a ratio at least of seven. That is optimal. So get rid, you know, if you want text, please don't embrace branding and embrace color contrast. The next, the next C is for camel case. Camel case is the practice to write sentences without punctuation marks or spaces. And what you do to uh, make clear the different letters is actually you capitalize the first letter of each word. So for example, MasterCard here becomes MasterCard where we have capitalized the C. And why I'm talking up with you about Camel case? Because of the hashtags. I'm sure you have seen these very, very long hashtags and because they are all in lowercase are so difficult to read and actually, but just make the, uh, you know, use camel case, they are easier to read for everybody, but especially for people with um, screen readers, because the screen readers, if you use camel case, they can make the difference between the different words but otherwise, for that, for uh, if you don't use camel case, this is a sole and uh, a unique word. So you can imagine how difficult it is. The next C is for captions. So hopefully by now all of you have taken advantage at some point to use captions, maybe if, you know in an airport or to. Uh, um, um, uh, watch a movie in the original language. And we have this perception that captions are only used for, for the, uh, you know, a must for deaf people. But actually there are tons of surveys now in social media that indicate that 80% of people start watching the videos on mute. So if you don't use captions, the pe most people won't click in your video. However, a lot of people pushes back uh, uh, regarding providing captions. If it's your own video, you can actually make use of YouTube, which uh, has um, what is called captions, actually, is artificial intelligence, but it's still you can download them, like in Zoom, and you can actually correct them 
and then upload it to another media. And you have social media like Instagram, where you can use stickers in your stories and add captions, okay? So we don't have any more, you know, uh, a way to say it's really difficult. And now we go with A. A is for alt text. You remember, I told you that my, my website initially was uh, inaccessible uh, to screen readers. And the reason is because my images didn't have alt text. I wasn't telling the screen reader what the image was about. And of course, the only thing that reads is the name of the file. But that can be solved very easily using a capability called all the text. When you upload your photo, for example, here is in LinkedIn, search really for a tab that says all text. That allows you usually between 150 and 1000 characters in the case of Twitter to uh, for, uh, provide a description. Doesn't need, you don't need to be Shakespeare. Just look at your picture and then if in doubt, take your mobile and think like you were telling to a, you know, telling to somebody on the phone what's on that for image. Uh, please do remember to convey some, some emotion. For example, it's not the same thing to say children here are raising their hands that children are cheering. And the other important thing, again, is that we think all text is only useful for, um, uh, for a screen reader users. But actually, the images that have all text uh, are, uh, uh, get picked up uh, by search engines. So if you add all text, your posts get, get higher hits. So it's a win-win all around. And finally, E is for emojis. So if uh, uh, you can read this uh, slide, you will very quickly catch up that I'm excited that I bought a, a car and I want to celebrate. However, if you are a screen reader user, this is what you get. Because each emoji has all text. So you can imagine this is really a mouthful. And however, don't panic, we still can use emojis. We just need to do it sparingly. So for example, please do move the emojis at the end of the sentences because it's less, less disruptive for screen reader users. Avoid repetition, the party popper, party popper, and don't replace text with emojis. So leave the word card and then use the emoji. Also be aware if you use, not, I'm not talking your you know, family group in WhatsApp. I'm talking, for example, in LinkedIn, you know, be aware of cultural differences. So try to get those that uh, emojis that, you know, is more clear, you know, happy or sad, rather than those that have a lot change with context. And very important, avoid emoticons, because some screen readers, they read them textually, like here. So in summary, uh, this is our, uh, you know, this is the, the formula for uh, a more inclusive social media, the three, uh, three CAA. Increase color contrast, use camel case in your hashtags, use captions with your videos, use alt text with your images, and be mindful with emojis. So if you find this useful, if it resonated with you, please do use it, promote it, and I'd love for you to tag me in some of your posts implemented those tips. Thank you very much. First of all, there's some audience participation in this. Sorry about that. So in the link in the chat, you should be able to see a link to uh, Menti, a Menti survey, click that link check out the Menti and ask the question, which is what's the question asked of teams when starting a new feature? You'll have to be quick, you've got about 20 seconds. Okay, so this presentation is about Monte Carlo based throughput forecasting. Um, some caveats at the beginning here. I'm not a statistical expert, it's hard to believe, but I do uh, believe in and rely on people who are 
kind of you would more describe as, as statistical experts. No forecasting or estimating approach is bomb proof. So the first regular weather forecast started in the 1860s. The planet is ringed with satellites and we still can't predict the weather. And that's because weather, like the features and products we work on, is complex. Data-driven forecasting, whatever it is, is only as good as the data it's based on. And most forecasting assumes that the future will be roughly equivalent to the past. That's a fairly key point. Okay, so I asked you, what is the question asked of teams right at the beginning? When you start a new feature, let's see what you said. Did you answer sensibly or not sensibly? Uh, you said overwhelmingly the sensible answer, which is when will it be done? You could have had a sensible or non-sensible option there. So I think I agree with you, lots of options, but yes, I think uh, in my experience as well, the question that we get asked is, when will it be done? So this is the cone of uncertainty. This is the thing. And the cone of uncertainty, you've probably seen something like this or various different uh, versions of this one. And what this says is that um, and things that are further away are harder to predict with uh, complex features. Uh, you could also look at it like this and say that the amount of estimation variability at the beginning of a project is probably highest. Um, we know comparatively little about product or feature at the beginning. This is the point of great experience with regard to the estimates. And this is also often the point at which teams are asked to provide estimates. Now, as this yellow line indicates, with iterative and incremental approaches towards uh, development, we seek to manage that uncertainty by uh, planning kind of short time boxes of work with feedback loops. So we regularly kind of erode the levels of uncertainty. And that also means that we can become gradually more accurate and precise with our estimates as we continue throughout the project. So forecasting can be an ongoing process involving collaborative decision making around risk. Now, uh, this kind of cone of uncertainty is well known to meteorologists. This is a very common analogy given in this kind of world when we're talking about this type of forecasting. Uh, but you can see the cone of uncertainty represented here. So this is Hurricane Dorian, and you can see that at the point of its inception, 5 a.m. Saturday down here, the path of the hurricane, the expected path, is quite narrow. So things that are closer to, we can have perhaps a higher degree of predictability around. But as we go through time uh, into the future, that path of the hurricane widens out. So the point it touches uh, the continental US there, the path of the hurricane is over about four or five states. Uh, so things that are hard, further away are harder to predict. This is the famous Hurricane Dorian, by the way, where President Trump um, augmented uh, to indicate greater uncertainty with a Sharpie, if you remember that. Okay, so Monte Carlo uh, forecasting is usually based on throughput. And when we talk about throughput, what we're talking about is the count of chunks of work. So if you, uh, if you define your work in chunks like tickets, it'll be the count of tickets. Uh, an alternative method that's used is story points. Uh, and most of us know about that. It's this kind of abstract system of pointing that indicates a uh, combination of complexity, risk, effort. So the story point velocity, traditional driven burn down, often provides a single date or a range as a result, but doesn't describe the likelihood of that date occurring. Uh, because averaging is used with these burn downs, it often comes in around 50%. If we're using that information to predict time as well around estimates, you need close correlation between the story points and the actual cycle times to be accurate. So when a stakeholder asks us when will it be done, usually the answer they don't want is 200 points. What they want to know is it will be six weeks, eight weeks, whatever. So this is an indication of what good would look like in terms of close correlation between story points and cycle time. So uh, horizontal axis is the story points. You can see they're using Fibonacci M plus one. The vertical axis is uh, actual cycle time in days. So you're seeing both precision and accuracy. So the, the coupling of the data points is quite close, so it's precise. And it's accurate within the context of this pointing system in that a three point, it takes longer than a two point, et cetera, et cetera. Now this is pretty good. So if your team data looks like that, I'd encourage you just to continue with it because you probably can't get much better than that. But I'll let you into a secret. I made that up. That's not real data. I made that up to show that picture. Would you like to see some real team data? Yeah, of course you would. Okay, so a slightly different picture. And this isn't particularly extreme. It's, you know, it's just a random team that I chose. So you can see here, you don't really have precision or accuracy in this uh, spread of data. So um, the three points can be between one and 36 days. Uh, a five point can 
take less time than a three point and a two point, and an eight point can take less than a five point. So if you check out this averaging line, this pink averaging line, you can see the problem that it's not often accurate. Um, and you see the five point, it kind of overlaps 25% of the time. Uh, and you can look at this uh, three point data here, 25 days upwards and say, well, they're outliers. Well, they are, uh, there's still a probability of that occurring, but it's kind of a low priority uh, probability. If you ignore that, you're kind of ignoring that pro probability. Now, it's often really, really super valuable to look at this data, share this data with the team and say, what are the, the occurrences, the situations that cause this to happen? You can often, often find really cool, useful um, improvements, local level, system level improvements around that. If you are purely, and you can improve your human estimation by looking at this and addressing it and getting better. Uh, often it's a case of we work on complex stuff, something happened and we didn't, we didn't expect it. Um, if you're using this purely to get better at estimation, you might wonder whether this is a good use of time. You could be using it to improve your collaboration, develop new features, improve quality, etc. So the Monte Carlo method as, a, as an, uh, an alternative to the kind of story point driven uh, burn down uses randomly selected historical data, throughput data from a range to run lots and lots of simulation, often in the tens of thousands, to generate a list of possible outcomes and the probability of that outcome occurring based on the return and the frequency of those, those results. So the Monte Carlo model cares about the actual cycle time something took to finish. It doesn't care about what you thought it was. It cares about what is. It doesn't care about the granularity that you slice your stories or the size uh, either. It will all become evident in the, in the output. So when you run, and there are lots of tools, this is one provided by Actionable Agile, but lots more are available. I don't receive any kickbacks or funding from them. Uh, there are free Excel-based tools out there as well you can use, but typically you'll get something in this kind of uh, format. So I've looked at about three months worth of data. Um, I've asked the tool when 28 days will complete. And what the tool has done is it's looked at my data over three months and it said, what are the number of occurrences where something took three days or less? What about when something took five days or less, six days, et cetera? And it's run a simulation. The default here is 10,000 trials. It doesn't really make a huge amount of difference to that core part, whether you run 10,000 or a million. It really makes a difference to the, the lead and the tail end. And you can see here's the result of that data and you've got the probability lines drawn down here, 50, 70, 85, 95%. And it has overlaid it very conveniently on this kind of calendar here. And I can assess, you know, I can judge my own level of probability that I'm, I'm interested in, that I would accept. And that depends on how much risk I'm willing to accept. And to me, that depends on what you're going to do with that data, what you're going to use it for. So if you're using it purely to kind of queue up work for the team, you might say, well, you know, let's take a fairly cavalier rough approach. And we can say that by the end of November, we're going to get close to delivering this thing. So we should queue up the next feature. Uh, so that's useful in terms of kind of deferring your decision making to a, a kind of last reasonable moment. If I'm going to use this data to uh, put onto a customer facing roadmap, I might want a higher degree of confidence and therefore a higher level of probability. So here are probably, you know, the colors indicate where yeah, your good place is. So 85%, 95% perhaps would be useful. Now, when I have that data, when someone asks me, when is it, when will it be done? I'm not going to say the 7th of December because I'm only telling, you know, part of the story here. So this is the typical kind of reply. I will give lots of safety language here. And it says uh, something like based on our current knowledge uh, and using past performance as an indicator, we can expect that feature X will complete between the beginning and the middle, middle of December with around 85% confidence. There's about a 50% chance of us completing the feature before December. There's your date range, there's your probability, there's a kitty. Um, now I talked a little bit at the beginning about garbage in, garbage out. I'm gonna run out of time to talk too much in detail about that. But to summarize, if you uh, take your data for forecasting from an unstable system, it's likely to be inaccurate, even if you choose a high level of probability, because you're choosing a high level of probability on unstable and unrepresentative data. And I put some bullets there about some of the attributes of unstable systems. Um, this is a quite a, a brief introduction to what can be quite a complex subject. So I've, I've stuck some resources at the end of this slide deck, and I'll probably post the slide deck on 
the Slack if you want to see that. Okay, most of this is drawn from the work of Daniel Vacanti, Troy McGuinness, and some from Skelton Thatcher. So those are the resources. That's my lightning talk. Thank you very much. Briefly, <laughs> and I was trying to avoid that. So I'm going to talk about decision making, and it's part of the things that we do every day. Just to follow up on what Neil discussed about risk and how. Uh, the make a decision regarding risk is also centered around decision making. So um, going forward, uh, this is simple about me. Um, my name is Mudupe and I love Agile. I like Agile in day to day is a mindset. It's, it's not say uh, a framework, but it's a mindset. Also, I'm a life learner. Uh, the moment I'm studying masters in building information management just to understand that area as well and this is part of uh, what i'm doing on day to day how to make decision to make uh, a business put you within construction industry um i love nature and i love traveling when possible so the spotlight i'm going to talk about on today's light and talk is to discuss about type of decision up to the strategy for improving decision making and why why decision making? It's because we need to engage ourselves within the team, uh, whether it's on the top level or on the middle level or on the lower level of management, or even within the scrum team or development team or production team, we need to engage to know where we're going. We need to understand the vision, which is the why, what we need to do and how we need to do it. And all this centers around making decision. It needs to be collaborative, it needs to be intuitively discussed, and it needs to be transparent. Overall, it helps us to be able to know the roadmap to whatever we need to do or we're planning to do. Yes, we make decisions based individually. Also, we also make decisions as a group within a scrum team, what we need to do when we need to prioritize product or pick up tickets or do anything, we're making decision. What's the next thing to do? What are we doing today? How many tickets are we doing today? And I'm gonna share about three models of de decision making. Quoted by uh, Albert Simon, he says there are three types of decision, a model of decision making. One is rational one, we centered about the perception of somebody looking at a situation, look whether it is a problem or an opportunity. The other one is bounded rationality, which is centered on picking, oh, the easiest one to do, and we just settle for less, and we just like, okay, this is okay, let's go around it. It can be heuristic as well, depending on how the group, uh, the person or the group make the decision. And the last one of the model is implicit favorite meaning based on, oh, the popular one, or the person that is talking, or percep perception about a particular standard. For instance, uh, somebody might be like, oh, just because that person uh, is very nerd, went to Cambridge, then that means that person will make a decision that is right. Well, actually, it's good to have a diverse view. And that is called retrospective model of decision making. We have different types of decision. We have what we call no program decision, and we have another one called program decision. And this is actually stem up by Gresham Laws of Planning. And it says that there are different ways that people make decision. What do we mean by non program? It's saying simple way, routine, the usual things we do. Because we used to do it, let's just do it that way. Why are we taking time to discuss it? Or the program one, which is Oh, this is a complex situation. What happened in COVID? How are we going to handle this? It is a major risk. So what are we going to do? But overall, Gresham Law of Planning said, the best place to be is actually the top right corner of that four square. But most people tend to be in the last boxes, especially the lower managers tend to be programmed and very urgently they make a decision without taking time to actually flesh it out and say, are we actually making the right decision here? Are we looking for the best outcome? But most people just orally kind of like, oh, we used to do it, let's do it that way. The other 
aspects I'm going to talk about is looking at the model, looking at the type of decision, what are the impacts that we have with group decision? Because it can be chaotic sometimes. Everybody wants to have a voice. Everybody wants to chip in everything. And we end up going away. But there are positive and negative side of group decision, even though it's very good. And looking at it is, out of it, you can say it gives us a broader perspective of the situation. And negatively, it actually affects time, which inhibits her ability to act quickly and decisively. And it can flip it that as opposite for individual decision as well. And what actually influences an individual or group or inhibits them to make a good decision? First, if you look at the influence on decision process, majorly is centered about the characteristics of the decision maker, the individual or the group. And also the problem they are addressing is a complex one or a situation one. Is it the one that needs urgent or is the one that we just need to do? And overall, the environment where they make the decision is in a very imposing psychologically safety way or where it is very toxic. Those are the things that actually influences effective decision. Likewise, onto the other side, what are the inhibitors? Information bias, selective perception, or norm, or, or, or norm, or, proper, or a norm for consistency. We used to do it, then we need to do it that way. But sometimes it's good to, to think about it. Sorry. When we look at agile environment, we will think about it as, we'll look at it as in, oh, we need to be a, in a group. I like this drawing because it's supposed to be like the manager or the management are not supposed to be there when they're making the decision. We're supposed to be a team of five. If you look at them, but well, it's just looking for presence. But it's supposed to be a self-directive, a self-organized team. Leave them to make the decision. So this could be an environment where it is not agile because it's not psychological safety. There's a bully there. And some will say, oh, we're doing agile. Really? This is not agile. Spending time to talk and discuss something without having a good planning, a focus for outcome, and you're saying you're being agile. That is not agile. Please don't do that. Lastly, what are the strategies for improving decision making? Because we talked about different decision, what influences it and what inhibits it. But how can we make a good decision making? You don't have to be in an angel environment to say, oh, because we don't do sprint or we waste time. We don't know how to do decision making. And that's why we never get anything done or there's an escalation of decision. In not agile environment, you have on my left side, all the things that you can do multiple advocacy or brainstorming or defi techniques you can help it likewise on my right side is or is the opposite for you uh, it's agile way of doing things where you can look at what is the vision how is you going to do it and what are you going to do there are tools there that you have used before and it can help even uh, whether you are in an agile environment or you're not in an agile environment looking at the perspective to say Yes, we're practicing Agile, but sometimes Agile does not fit some situation. In summary, I just want to summarize that decision making is all about transparency, interactive environment and collaboration. And for what? Expected outcomes and value. Thank you. Okay, uh, so thanks, thanks Simon, and special thanks to um, uh, your team for giving me an opportunity to speak. Uh, I know I was a kind of a last minute entry, but really appreciate you accommodating me. And uh, yeah, the topic which um, I'm going to talk about is the famous uh, Disney movie, um, uh, uh, which actually changed my perspective about servant leadership. So when I looked at this movie, when I watched this movie for the first time, I watched it like any individual to enjoy the movie. And over a period of time, I could correlate that um, um, many of the scenes in this movie, many of the events in this movie 
are actually talking about the servant leadership approach and that is what um, i'm going to present my thoughts here and happy to have your feedback um, after the session happy to go in for any questions more questions around this and um, uh, i mean uh, this is a dialogue which um, if you remember i mean those of you who have watched this movie uh, this is what um, uh, the king of the jungle lion mufasa says in that movie everything you see exists together in a delicate balance as a king you need to understand uh, that balance and respect all the creatures from the crawling ant to the uh, to the leaping antelope right i mean this is a dialogue which really talks about the servant leadership concept right i mean as a servant leader i am there to serve my team i am not there to earn profits i am not there to actually earn um, uh, accolades i am there to help my team uh, to improve itself right uh, that is what um, is the intention and that is what um, uh, this dialogue from the famous movie lion king is talking about and this is a uh, this is a dialogue which he says to that young cub what you see here uh, simba right so uh, if you look at the movie it starts with an introduction of uh, this simba being born and um, uh, the mandrill in that movie rafiki introducing simba to the entire uh, set of animal kingdom that he is going to be the future king of all of us right so that's uh, uh, one of the aspects of uh, lion king which um, actually comes to my mind the second thing right uh, another conversation between the two of them between uh, simba and mufasa while others search for what they can take a true king searches for what he can give this is nothing but servant leadership right i mean yes we all know servant leadership is a concept introduced by robert greenleaf in 70s it has been used uh, predominantly across the political economic and the social world and um, we as agile leaders um, are um, striving to become true leaders um, in our transformation uh, and this is what a beautiful dialogue from that movie says while um, while others search for what they can take it's not about me getting any benefit again a true king is someone who's always looking for what he or she can give uh, what he can give to the uh, to his subjects right uh, so that is another interesting uh, dialogue from the movie right uh, where, where it talks about giving rather than taking okay so as i said like i mean this concept has been there for pretty long we have lot of examples in the political world in the social world in the corporate world about servant leadership um and i've just tried to list uh, some of the concepts of course i'm not going into the definition of servant leadership um as i said robert greenleaf has already put forward this um, in his uh, thought paper around it and um, yeah i mean uh, there has been debate around the world whether it really works is it just a concept or is it something which really works in the real world lot of literature has happened around it uh, has been written around it uh, by the very famous um, chairman of the virgin group richard branson Uh, to the thought leader simon senek and of course a very classic book on this employees first customers second uh, from the ex ceo of hcl corporation vidit nair where he talks about how servant leadership was applied in the corporate world coming back again to the lion king movie uh, what i have tried to do in the next slide is um, and i'll take another 5 minutes for this uh, is uh, that what exactly does this movie talks about are some of the key attributes of a servant leader a servant leader is a person who is a coach someone who provides that safety net or a cushion someone who is humble grounded i would say someone who celebrates uh, someone who gives the team its credit a servant leader is transparent in his or her um, i would say outlook in his or her behavior and last but definitely not the least a motivator so i would say these are some of the attributes which come out also in that movie so if you look at that movie carefully these six attributes are something which are very well articulated in that movie uh, the lion king um, produced by disney corp so what do i mean by a coach or what do we mean by a servant leader being a coach for my team right or a coach to my subject if you see in that movie uh, the mandrill rafiki protects uh, protects simba right uh, so when uh, there's a crisis in the kingdom when the when king mufasa gets killed uh, the entire blame comes on um, actually simba young singa simba the cub right and it is rafiki who protects him from um, from the villain who's which is played by a character called scar right so this person actually coaches this person takes up the role of a coach when his father uh, dies in unforeseen circumstances this person takes him to a safe harbor location 
uh, uh, the mandrill actually coaches him, mentors him, guides him, and again prepares himself to take up that kingdom in that fight, right? Uh, you would have seen that in that movie. So this is where as a servant leader, many times when I see that my team is struggling or my team is unable to do the work, there's a lot of pressure. I have to help my team. I need to come and coach my team and help them guide and reach towards the uh, the, uh, their due course, right? So that is where the coaching aspect of a servant leadership comes. And a very interesting quote, the interesting thing about coaching is that you have to trouble the comfortable and comfort the trouble. Very aptly said uh, by Rick Charlesworth, uh, the former hockey co coach of Australia. Okay, uh, moving to the next one. As a servant leader, I need to provide that cushion. I need to provide that safety net to my team, right? So if uh, if at all my team is getting trouble, if at all my team is taking some experiments and those experiments fail, I need to provide that cushion. And which is again reflected in that movie um, with basically Jazu and uh, uh, again, um, um, again, basically Rafiki. Uh, coming together and protecting Simba, right? Um, they encourage Simba to challenge um, uh, the wrongdoings of uh, 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 of what we call as the scar, as scar, the another king, another person, another lion who has taken over the kingdom. At the same time, they provide that cushion that in case there is any problem, this is a cushion what we have, right? And uh, we are there to help you. We are behind you to support you. And it doesn't mean that we are leaving you alone in this fight. We are there to fight with you and to achieve what is due to you. And safety isn't uh, expensive, as we say, right? It's priceless, right? So we have to give that priceless, um, I would say, comfort to our team members as a servant leader. Uh, the next uh, key attribute of a servant leader is grounded or being humble, right? Someone who's down to earth, someone who will accept mistakes, someone who will own up the mistakes, having a lot of human sense. And uh, this is what also happened with Simba in the movie, right? He, um, he thought that, um, I mean, he was trying to protect his father. He was trying to get his father up from that cliff. But unfortunately, due to the wickedness of Scar, um, his father uh, died, right? And the entire blame came on young, poor Simba. Now, this uh, cub is shown as accepting that. I mean, he knows that, uh, yeah, I mean, he has lost his father. And when Scar accuses him of killing his father, he's very humble and down to earth. And he says, yeah, probably this could have happened. This is something which could have happened. So I'm admitting my mistake. I admit that, yes, I have made a mistake. So as a servant leader, one of the important attributes is, if at all um, uh, there's a wrong coaching what has happened, if at all there's a wrong guidance which has been given, own up those mistakes and move ahead, right? It's always about um, admitting yourself and moving ahead, right? Uh, a very famous quote, courage is grace under pressure. Yeah, moving ahead, celebrate, right? Uh, celebrate uh, your success, celebrate failures. I think that's also another key attribute of a, a servant leader, what we have. A very famous picture uh, from an old, um, uh, old issue of Time magazine, where you see uh, these group of workers sitting on a construction, um, I would say, beam, which they have uh, made. And I look at this picture in a different way. I look at this picture, these people who have constructed this beam, they are enjoying the product. How many of us really love the products what we build, right? And that is where a servant leader has to encourage his or her team to own up and celebrate the good products what they have made, right? Again, in the movie, you will see that once Simba returns to the kingdom, he is crowned as a new king and he celebrates that. He celebrates that by um, uh, actually following the footsteps of his uh, father, Musafa. Okay, uh, then we have what we call as transparent. Am I transparent in my dealing? Am I willing to receive feedback? I'm willing to give feedback and I'm open to take criticism. So that's another attribute uh, what we have from a servant leadership. Um, um, again, very well amplified in multiple scenes in the movie. And last but definitely not the least, what we have in the movie is also the motivation. Right. Am I motivating my team members? My leader should constantly motivate. Right. Um, he or she should constantly motivate me. So there are days in the engagement where I will feel that I am depressed. Things are not really working well as they should be working. So someone who will actually uh, trying to motivate me, my leader should motivate me. Someone who believes in my strengths, someone who understands what are my limitations are and works towards helping me. 
uh, improve my limitations or helping me actually enhance my um, I would I would say um, remove those impediments and limitations and helps me grow further in my role. So that's another important attribute of the role of a servant leader uh, as a motivator. Right? Again, you find um, uh, the the mandrill there, Rafiki, who plays that role very effectively along with uh, Zazu, uh, the horn bill. Um, who both of them play that role very craftily in the movie. Yeah, I think I'm almost out of time uh, or um, I think I might have exceeded time. So really sorry for that in case I have exceeded the time. Uh, but this is a short and a sweet lightning talk, which I wanted to do and present with you uh, to all of you. My learnings from the movie, The Lion King. And once again, thanks for providing me an opportunity and open for any questions during the Q&A round. So thanks. Thanks, everyone. Grim 